I'm Ron Wyatt. Welcome to the Ark of the Covenant dig. Uh, we've been working in this uh, area since uh, 1979 and uh, shall we say it hasn't been an easy job. In 1982 we were able to get into the chamber where uh, we saw some of the furnishings from the first temple. Now we accomplished that by going down through this hole here that's about 40 foot deep and then coming out of there back up into a chimney in uh, spelunker terminology and then squeezing on into the chamber. We broke our way in through uh, a hole. Uh, we went 60 feet underground, we came back up. I mean, it was a real labyrinth. But once you got in this chamber, there sat a door right at the end of the chamber. And the people that brought this thing in busted a chunk of stone loose, dug out from behind it, laid it down, cut a doorway out in there, carried this stuff in. And then they covered them with animal skins, and then they covered them with wooden boards, and then stones. They packed that thing full of stones, backed out and shoved that chunk of rock back in place and filled in behind it. And today from the outside it just looks like a crack that an earthquake made, and there's a lot of those in that scarp. Now, if it were just simply getting into the chamber, we could do that. But once we get in there, we have to have the ability to get all of those things out of that chamber and safely to the surface. So it's not like just treasure hunting where you go in and, and get whatever is there and take it out. We have to consider taking care of the objects that are beyond this wall. And we're bringing the radar scanning equipment out of the hotel here. That's right, and take about a minute for the scan. All right. Don't just start. The excavation site's kind of hid by these bushes, so a lot of people, as they walk along this path, don't necessarily see it, but sometimes they'll hear the noise. Now, I think these must be cracks in the rocks. These little white lines going through there must be cracks or something. From here to here, the, the uh, transducer is stationary, because it's all the same all the way down. And it looks like there's a cavern there, which I don't know what scale he added on, so you can work out how deep it is from the surface, or from where the transducer is to the cavern, if you know what scale, and you've calibrated to that scale. Feet down, roughly, yeah. 45 feet down. Yeah. Old wall we found, all digging down. And an old miner, <laughs> an old miner. Then the hole keeps going down about how far, so 
That's another 10 feet down there. 10 feet down to Ron, down the bottom. He's found a really <coughs> on the end of the jackhammer. I'm about to, contemplating. Gorgeous. All right, at this point, uh, you are 45 feet under the ground. Uh, all of the debris above us is from the many different destruction levels of Jerusalem. In antiquity, when a city got destroyed, instead of coming back, moving all the debris away and starting from bedrock, they would just level off what was left of the city and start it from that point on up. And Jerusalem has been destroyed at least 10 times throughout antiquity. And we are down at right here is the pre-Babylonian area uh, or strata. Now what I wanted to point out to you here is in front of me you see some large stones that are blocking an entrance into a chamber. Now in order to conceal the chamber they couldn't just block the chamber entrance itself otherwise this would call attention to it. So they put up a veneer that went around the escarpment some distance and this would at least confuse anybody that was looking for an entrance and perhaps make them believe that the stone veneer was there for some other reason. Now in this particular quarry and in many others from antiquity they would cut the stone back until they came to chambers or where the water had eroded and dissolved the stone away. This type of material was unusable for their purposes in cutting uh, out good uh, strong blocks of stone for building purposes. So when uh, they cut into these chambers they would go around and leave a thin wall uh, between the chamber and the outside taking all of the good stone away. So this is the situation that we're looking at here and that we have looked at in several other areas in this particular cave complex. Now uh, this wall here was put up very hastily. They have had mortar uh, back to Babylonian and pre-Babylonian times and this wall as you will see instead of mortar uh, they used some red clay. Now this tells us that they did all of this in quite a hurry. So given all of this information and the fact that I was in a chamber in this uh, general location, uh, however it is a little confusing once you crawl around through these tunnels to try to keep oriented if you don't have a compass on you. But our radar, our subsurface interface radar scanner shows that there is a chamber uh, approximately 18 inches behind this wall and one of the shots that we got from the side showed a level of uh, contents in the chamber uh, with a lessened contents near the bottom and in experimentation we find that this usually represents something that's standing on legs or up on some sort of a pedestal. We're going to attempt to <clears throat> put a hole through there with this drill. Alright, now as we're down here with a lot of debris over us, quite enough to bury us, uh, and some future archaeologists, if time lasts long, would, long enough, would find our remains, that is too much vibration down in this area and would trigger earth slides, which we have experienced several of. So, you can you see, yeah. this is teensy. This is frightening. Take a good look. <clears throat> this just came in a little bit earlier, and that's why they had to put these boards up. Behind, I don't know if you can see, there's nothing. There's the air hose. There's Frank laying the drill down. And I am going to very carefully try to scoot down a little at a time. Oh. You can see 
see it straight down. Strength with a bucket of rocks. Can you see the full depth of it over there where Bob is? Pretty far down in there. There's About another Bob. four feet. What is, now, what is he doing down there, Frank? He's cleaning off, we hope, right to his right-hand side. The face of the cliff goes straight down, and we're hoping that that will be the chamber to the right if we can find our way into it through solid rock right there. Wow. You can't see it too well from where you're at, but it's been plain straight down. Over here to my left is where we had the cave in. Oh, right there. I don't know if you can, if this is recording very well or not. It looks like I'm fogged up, but you can see I am in a very confined space. And these guys have been working in here non-stop, day after day. Probably try to find the entrance, because to use a jackhammer with all this loose material would be almost impossible. We've already had one cave in. So we'll have to go for finding some way into it, if we can, like a door or some kind of an entrance door. Hmm. Is it hard to believe. Okay. I think I probably better call it quits for then back up behind me and exit so they can get someone in here to... see the wall and all that? Well, yeah. I didn't go, you know, very far. Yeah. I just went down to about there. Okay. But she did see the wall. Yeah. You can see how small that hole is. I don't know how to get in there. I can hardly get in there. Oh. There's the air hose, which doubles as the communications line. Show you this whole chamber. At times there would be how many men in here, Dale, at one time? Mm, seven, seven eight. or eight. And I'm looking straight up now. Uh oh, I hear Bucket coming up. Oh, bucket. Yeah, now this is what they do. They haul the buckets up and then they cut them okay, in. Go ahead. Dale puts them on. Oh. And Ed up there is hoisting it up through the hole. And Simon's grabbing it and handing it to Nathan. And Nathan's giving it to Mark, who's hauling it off to the dump. Boom. Dale, hey, you got any buckets empty out there? Uh, yep. Yeah. One. One down below? It is straight no. down. Ron says about 40 foot down here. See, we're just standing on, we're in a hole. Well, we're standing no, no, no. on boards that have been laid across to the ledges. Oh. Coming down? All right. Oh. That's coming how down. the buckets come down. That's it. I missed that, but they just tossed them down the hole. First time in ten months. Well done. That's very good work. Should have knocked that one over. <coughs> We're going to follow Mark <laughs> over to the bus station. See, what they have to do is every time they get buckets of dirt or rock out of there, they have to walk along this path. Now we're heading towards the bus station where this morning they got tear gas twice. And Ron was over here dumping rock at the time and got, got it full force.
this is where they dump. You can see it's quite full. We're standing now at the edge of the garden tomb area where the bus station is looking outwards in the direction of the excavation. Now, we're walking around. And we're going to go up and look at the bus station where all the tear gas came from this morning. There it is. I'll get over here in a better position. down to where the excavation is, which is right there. We're looking right into the area that it is, right there. This is where Christ was actually crucified. And then right around the corner, this is too. Jerusalem is situated on two mountains, Mount Zion on the west and Mount Moriah on the east. Moriah extends from the Temple Mount on the south end and continues beyond the city wall to the north. In ancient times, a dry moat was cut through this mountain to prevent invading armies from easily entering the city from the north. The northern part of the mountain, located outside of the city, was then used at some point in time as a quarry, and where the mountain was cut away is very visible. Along the escarpment or cliff face which was formed when it was quarried is located the tomb. Also along this escarpment is the well-known skull face. And between the skull face and the tomb is the site Ron Wyatt pointed to in 1978 when he said that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. North of the city wall of Jerusalem sits a beautiful garden. Within this garden is the tomb known as the Garden Tomb, chiseled into the rock of the northern part of Mount Moriah. Okay, now we're going to go in. Here we can see inside of the tomb. Very old cross. This one is just as it was originally carved out. This is a very small area. I don't know if someone was to be buried there or not. But here, we can see, and right back here, it was dug out more, presumably because Christ was taller to accommodate him. Yeah. 
was out the store and Christ walked. Walked on this floor. when I started excavating down that cliff wall, first of all, I discovered the cutouts in the wall of the cliff where they had posted the signs. We painted or drew Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, in the Roman and the Greek and the Hebrew languages, and we put them there, and we uh, set this up to uh, resemble what happened to Christ on the cross okay now the cross hole is actually right straight down below where we set this thing up and of course this is the chamber that you've been looking around through with us as we worked now this whole field here needs to be taken out now here we have niches these are where the titles of the criminals that were crucified were placed, the name and what they were accused of. This is one right here, and then there's one right up there, and then of course there's one right under that rubble right there that we have filmed before. All of that needs to come out and right back directly behind and under all of that rubble is a cross hole right directly below the center line of these niches. And then out from that is a first century Christian church and the massive 13 foot 2 inch stone that sealed the sepulcher that Christ was buried in is affixed into the wall of that first century church that's buried on this site. And this, then, is the Calvary Scarp. Our escarpment. The place outside the city, on the north side where most of the traffic passed through, that criminals were executed. What an enormous amount of work this was and the tremendous difficulties involved. The maze of tunnels seemed endless as did the many tons of rock and rubble that was removed over the years of work there. He didn't confine his search for the tunnel to the cave system. He believed for various reasons that it most likely had its beginning in Zedekiah's cave the huge ancient quarry underneath the old city carved out of the southern portion of Mount Moriah. He found a tunnel entrance sealed with blocks which appeared to be heading in the correct direction. Now there's two things that are immediately apparent. One is from the color of that rock. This is the old water channel. Also that you're looking at almost a six foot hole there that's been plugged with those rocks and it's aimed exactly in the direction that our 
excavation across the street is located in. Now here's another thing that it wasn't noticed. This rock right immediately to your left is part of a wall. This right here. See that stone, that stone, that stone, another stone below it. So this was double sealed. And whoever explored the cave in recent times broke through this one, but then they did not break through that second one. And we can assume that there's maybe some more baffles or block areas farther back. Upon opening it, he resealed it. It was not the tunnel he was looking for. Each time Ron and his crew excavated, the entrance to the cave system had to be refilled and the area completely cleaned up before they left. This was a tremendous task, as was reopening it each time they returned. So Ron finally installed a steel door, which could be easily covered and uncovered with dirt and gravel, yet it allowed easy entrance. It also allowed him the ability to enter the system alone without a crew. This same trip, he and the crew built a beautiful retaining wall around the area of ground directly below the cutouts or niches and above the cross holes. Getting a little look at our fancy stonework. Ron continued to persist and spent every spare moment and every spare dime in his search for the tunnel. Perhaps it was inevitable that the day would come when he became discouraged. Someone uninvited showed up when he arrived to resume work there. In the following, as Ron relates what happened next, the camera battery died unexpectedly, which is why it is edited. And, uh... When I arrived at the Jerusalem Hotel, sitting on the front stoop, was this medical doctor who said, <coughs> Ron, I'm here to help you. Well, bless his heart, he hadn't asked my permission or anything. said nothing. He just popped up. Well, that makes me rather unlikely to give him the combination to the uh, vault, if you know what I mean. And so, anyway... I was convinced that one of my dumb mistakes had been too many and that God couldn't use me anymore. So he'd sent this fellow there so I couldn't work on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, he would have had to share my experiences in order to know what a crushing blow that was. See, I know I'm unworthy. And I thought, okay, finally you messed up, and you're out of it. I said a little prayer. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. If there's anything I can help, whoever you want to finish the job, just let me know, and I'll do what I can. Well, I couldn't work on the Ark of the Covenant with that guy around, so we volunteered to clean the garden tomb. In the back part of it, there was about 100 years worth of garbage and one thing and another that had just been thrown back there over the years. So we hauled out of there something like 20 big truckloads of trash. And uh, it was hot that September, blistering hot. And we, I had gotten a little fan to get some air stirring. And the fan died. Well, added on the rest of my miseries, that was almost too much. You know, you remember the story of Jonah and his gourd vine? I could sympathize with him at that point in time. Anyway, I told everybody else, I said, look, just find you a shade somewhere and eat your lunches. And, uh, and I'll try to fix the fan. So I just sat down on the sidewalk. Anyway, I was sitting down there working on this fan. And a voice said to me, God bless you and what you're doing here. 
So I looked up, and this being was up on this landing, the top of those stairs. Looked exactly like I figured Christ would look, have looked. And the outfit that he had on was not exactly like the Muslims wear today, but it was closer to that than it was anything else I had seen. So I said, are you from around here, sir? And he said, no. And I said, well, then you're a tourist. And he said, no. And I thought, well, he doesn't want to talk with me. Obviously, I didn't know what else to say. And then he said, I'm on my way from South Africa to the New Jerusalem. Well, that certainly eliminated a whole lot of possibilities there. Immediately that proved that he was a heavenly being. And I just sat there, couldn't say anything, and he looked at, just continued to look at me. He said, God bless you. In what you're doing here. He was at the top of those stairs and he walked right back that little short sidewalk to the right of that big pine tree and headed for the front gate. Well this doctor of all people was the only one in earshot and he was back under some shrubs in the shade eating his lunch and he piped up and he says, Ron, do you suppose we've been talking with an angel? And I said, at least. Well, I worked with great enthusiasm for the rest of that day. When we left the garden too, I asked the ladies in there, I said, what did you think of that big tall man dressed in ancient Jewish garb? They looked at me kind of funny. And they said, there's been nobody in there here like that today. And then one of them said, well, Mr. Wyatt, there's never been anybody in here like that. So somewhere between where he turned right past that pine tree and before he got to the office, he went on to the New Jerusalem. The uninvited guest eventually left and they were able to resume work for a brief time. At this time, Ron made the following discovery. Just a brief look around the surrounding areas here to identify the location of this site. Down to the left, of course, is down where the work's being done in the excavation. As you hear the uh, electric jackhammer. We have been probing around up here by the cross hole and just immediately to the left of the film container you see some dark pigmented material. Now this appears to be dried blood but we do plan to put some of this in the uh, film case and take it back and have it analyzed to see if it is blood. Now this is right under the cutouts where Christ uh, was crucified and near the cross hole that we believe to be the one he was crucified on. They're right at the very tip of the uh, Tab. There's some more of this real dark material. 
as soon as it's exposed to the light, it begins to turn a lighter brown. And this uh, is typical of very old blood. So we'll take some more of this sample here. And it seems to have come down through this area here as we've collected it all the way along and down into this crevice that communicates with the chamber that the Ark of the Covenant's in. It comes right down through here and down this way and around through a crack right in here and down through this area. Anyway, I have a, several samples of it that I have taken. For many years, the specimen sat untouched. Then, in 1996, when Ron was in Great Britain, Richard and Elizabeth Reeves and their sons came to Nashville to our home. Richard had a new, unique, and very powerful microscope he wanted to show us. Leviticus 17.14 informs us that the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Once again, scientists are finding out that the truths of Scripture are far more literal than they ever imagined. Tiny particles have been discovered in blood that are seemingly indestructible. These tiny particles are less than a tenth of a micron in size, and while they cannot be seen using standard medical microscopes, new methods of microscopy have been developed which makes it possible to see them in their living state. The French scientist Gaston Masons designed special microscope components that would allow him to see these particles which he entitled somatids, meaning the body that creates. Through experimentation, Professor Masons found that these somatids contain genetic material yet to be fully understood by the scientific community. They are polymorphic in nature, growing from stage to stage, and are unaffected by high temperatures, extremely toxic chemicals, or even nuclear radiation. Professor Masons believes these somatids to be subcellular living and reproducing entities, the precursor of DNA, and that they may be the building blocks of life. About six years ago, I learned about these particles as a result of some research that I was conducting, which was totally non-related to archaeology. At that time, I was using a standard medical microscope and while I could not see these particles, I knew they had to be there. I began to develop my own microscope patterned after the design of Professor Nason's. What you see behind me is that microscope in its latest stage of development. The microscope employs an extremely bright xenon or mercury light source, which can be combined with tungsten light. The light is directed across the microscopic specimen rather than on or through it in what is known as a dark field configuration. The light reflecting off the object is transmitted through the microscope and is magnified over a thousand times. The image is then captured by a sensitive CCD camera and transmitted to a monitor for viewing at screen magnifications of up to 30,000 X. Under these conditions, the tiny living particles can plainly be seen against a dark background. In 1996, my family and I made a trip to Nashville to visit the Wyatts. I brought along the microscope, which at that time was somewhat portable in its early stage of development, and set it up in the basement of the Wyatt's house. One evening, Mary Nell Wyatt asked me to take a look at some material from a burial cave to see if these tiny particles were present. Without my knowledge, one of the samples was actually the blood sample that Ron had taken from the Ark of the Covenant dig. The sample was placed under the microscope and as the specimen began to come into focus, thousands of tiny particles, summatids if you will, became plainly visible. At that time, Mary Nell, who was standing behind me, began to weep. As I turned around and saw the expression on her face, I realized immediately that the sample we were looking at was actually the sample that Ron had found to be the blood of Christ. Okay, Mary Nell's going to take the sample and uh, mix it with sterile water.
in a test tube there that we've That'll be enough. Okay. Then she's going to take some sterile water and uh, a little bit. Just just a drop's all we need, Mary Nell. Okay, so now that we've got the sample on the slide, we'll go ahead and focus into the sample and see what comes up on the screen here. And there they are, thousands of living particles, less than a quarter of a micron in size. Gee. Spores are maybe a half micron, and uh, but most of those little particles we're looking at is 17,000 x magnified on the screen 17,000 times. You know, in the Bible it tells us that the life is in the blood, and there's little living particles that uh, most people are unaware of that are there. This is the same thing we see in living blood. Uh, the scientist in Canada says that these things never die. Uh, the blood may dry up, uh, but these things, he says, they're indestructible, and he says they are the basis of life. The results we obtained in no way can be said to be proof that the specimen was the blood of Christ but based on the location from which the specimen came, we believe it was what Ron believed it was. Years earlier, Ron had taken a blood specimen from the lid of the case which contained the Ark of the Covenant. The blood of Christ is only dried out, folks. It's not dead. When we rehydrated it with normal saline, 72 hours of body temperature with slight, very gentle, swirling and put the white blood cells in a growth medium 48 hours later we did a chromosome here i didn't this was in israel it has 24 chromosomes only all of us here have 46 unless you know we have there's a couple of genetic uh, anomalies that make that different but Christ received 23 from his mother and one Y, sex determining factor from his father who was not a human father. Because had he received that from a human father, it would have been accompanied by 22 autosomes. Now what this basically means is that his height, his eye color, his hair color, and all of this was supplied from the genes of his mother's gene pool. However, Mary and Joseph both descended from David, uh, but none of us have 24 chromosomes. Well, they knew, and they told me before I asked them to, when I asked them to perform this investigation, that guy dried blood, you can't get a chromosome count on it because the white blood cells have to be alive and well in order to do that. You can get DNA, you can get some other things, but you can't have a chromosome count. So this blood is unique, <laughs> and it is Christ's blood. And that's With no explanations from Ron, the excavation suddenly came to a stop. On a later trip to Jerusalem, Ron entered the cave system alone through the metal door, and for the first time in quite a while he re-entered the chamber with the Ark of the Covenant. To his utter surprise and disbelief, he found the chamber had been completely cleaned out and all the items from the temple were set up. No longer was the Ark in the stone case.
the chamber where I found the Ark of the Covenant has since been perfectly cleaned out. And the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick, the golden altar of incense, they are all set out as they were in the earthly temple, except that the Ark of the Covenant is set, setting against the 12 foot long and 18 foot wide or high wall. He found the original tunnel was also cleaned out, and he followed it to discover that it did indeed open into Zedekiah's cave. It was not the tunnel he and his crew had opened earlier. In the following years, Ron entered the chamber with the Ark a number of times. Yes, the tables and stone were found in the Ark of the Covenant. I removed them with the assistance of four angels who lived in the mercy seat, which I would estimate weighs about 900 pounds of solid gold. And one of these angels told me to take the tables of stone out of there. He said, God wants everyone to see those. And so I took them out, backed up, stood there, froze them in place, and I, well, I just can't describe my physical state or mental state or anything else. If, if you know, I didn't have some physical evidence to prove it happened, I think I had a dream or something. But anyway, they're on a stone ledge right in the same chamber. That's where the angel put them after I handed them to him. I didn't know what to do with them. And uh, I was told that these are to be presented with the blood evidence when the mark of the beast law is passed or enforced. Now, I know everybody wonders about what it is, the mark of the beast. You've heard all kinds of rumors, stories, and all of this. I'll tell you quick and simple. If you keep the Ten Commandments that God wrote upon those tables of stone, and about which he says in Psalms 89 and 34, those of you that are writing down text, you'll want this one. He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. He spoke the Ten Commandments from the mountaintop. He wrote them in stone, and he says, nothing will change. Right? If you keep that law, you will receive the seal of God. Soon there will be a set of man-made laws. These man-made laws will require that you break God's Ten Commandments. Christ said of the Pharisees, For it is in vain that they who worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If you keep those man-made laws and break God's Ten Commandments, you will receive the mark of the beast blood of his son on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Now the mechanics of that, how it happened, is in Matthew chapter 27 verses 50 through 53. It says, when he had cried again, he died. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Then the earth shook and the rocks were rent and the graves were opened. When the rocks rent, the cliff behind where Christ was being crucified split all the way down, right past the left side of the cross hole and down into the chamber where God had hidden the Ark of the Covenant some 600 years before. And when the centurion pierced, pierced Christ's spleen and probably the left ventricle of the heart, depending on how deep the thrust went, the blood and the, the platelets and serum gushed out and went down through that crack onto the Ark of the Covenant 20 feet below and fulfilled, ratified, if you please, the old and the new covenant. And at that moment, you and I were bought with Christ, as was everyone else on this planet, if they will only take advantage of what was done for them. What Christ did was enough 
to redeem every man, woman, and child that has ever been born on planet Earth. The tragedy is that so few avail themselves of that wonderful gift. Now, the next morning, and this is in Matthew chapter 28, it says, the angel descended to roll back the stone and there was a great earthquake. I believe that God closed the crack at that point in time because there's no evidence of any surface water, rain, or dirt, dust, anything else having fallen through that crack other than just the blood of Jesus. And there it remained for almost 2,000 years. But the ark was sitting there 600 years before the blood actually went on there. Appreciate the time y'all have shared with me here. When I get to heaven, I'm going to look around and I want to see every one of you there. You can make it with God's help. Please. Don't let all of that go to waste. Please. Take advantage of that wonderful opportunity.